and uh, we are guaranteeing all their rights within the limits of Islam. But despite today's words, the Taliban has a long history of quashing the human rights of women and in fear, women are now nearly absent from the streets of Afghanistan cities. Meanwhile, at Kabul airport, the airlift continues. Americans and Afghans who helped getting out and so many more crashing the airport gates hoping to flee the country. But unlike images of a day ago that saw people hanging on to a military transport as it took off, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan today said, The airport is secure, the flights are going, the people are coming, and we will continue to do that in the days ahead. That echoed by General Frank McKenzie, the head of CENTCOM, who is the top U.S. military commander in the Middle East. He made a later revealed secret visit to the airport today. In Haiti, the response to the deadly weekend earthquake on pause as heavy rain from Tropical Storm Grace lashes the country. The death toll from the quake now approaching 2,000, nearly 10,000 injured. Here at home, monsoon like rains causing major flooding in Flagstaff, Arizona. Residents like this woman piling sandbags waist high to keep water out of her home. It's terrifying. This is the fourth time that this has come through, and every time it's worse. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, whose banned masks and vaccination mandates in his state, has now himself tested positive for COVID-19. He reports that he's vaccinated. The news as Texas today hits 20,123 confirmed COVID-19 cases with 96 fatalities. You're listening to ABC News. From the KMET Weather Center for Beaumont Planning in the Pass area, this afternoon we'll have sunny skies, high 92. Partly to mostly cloudy with patchy fog forming tonight, low 64. Low clouds and fog start Wednesday, otherwise sunny, high 82. For Redlands this afternoon, we'll see plenty of sunshine, high 92. And for the desert cities, it's going to be mostly sunny or high 104. I'm meteorologist Jim Rinaldi for Smart Talk 1490, KMET. Take KMET 1490 AM with you everywhere you go by downloading our free smartphone apps found on the KMET website, KMET1490AM.com. You can also go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store on your phone to download the free app. Now you can listen live or play any of your favorite programmers podcasts using your smartphone. Go to KMET1490AM.com and download your free phone app today. The following is a paid program. Views and claims expressed are those of the program producer and are not endorsed by this station. Opinions expressed are not necessarily those of radio station KMET, its management, employees, or affiliates. The WK Law Power Hour is here to take you from zero to hero in legal knowledge in 60 minutes. A law firm with 40 years of experience is ready to give you legal guidance you need for free. What could be better than that? Amazing stories about actual cases, interesting and informative guests. Listen, watch, call in. Come ready to learn. And now your host for WK Law Power Hour, Paul Wallen. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Paul Wallen, senior partner of Wallen & Claridge, a law corporation, here in Southern California, and this is exciting. This is our 14th show, 14 weeks, and with every single show, we get more listeners, more viewers, more questions, and we answer legal questions for free. What could be better than that? Legal knowledge is power. The more legal knowledge you have, the more power you have to make the right decisions, whether it be fighting a DUI and what blood alcohol test to take, or how do you fight a traffic ticket? Today, we're going to be talking to a very, very experienced family law attorney, and we're going to talk about child custody and child support, and how do you get out of a bad marriage, and what if your husband's cheating on you, and grandparents' rights, and how do grandparents get rights to visit their children? So it's a really, really interesting legal show, and we also talk about issues of the day. 877-466-5245. You can call our office for legal advice. And if you want to call on the show today, 951-922-3532. And we'll be glad to talk to you about any legal question you have or even one of the legal issues of the day that we tackle. I've been a lawyer for 44 years. I know that's hard to believe that anyone could do anything for that long, let alone look as young as I do. Huh? 
So the purpose of the show is to answer your legal questions, to give you legal knowledge. And if you want to call, that would be a great idea. Today, we have the great privilege of speaking for the entire hour with Wallen and Clarich's family law attorney, Neelam Fister. She is very brilliant. She handles every kind of family law case. She handles child dependency law, just many different legal issues related to family law. We handle cases all through Southern California. That includes if you want a restraining order or you fighting a restraining order, you can do that by having us represent you. If you just have a legal question and you're not, don't have money, believe it or not, you don't even have to have money. And we'll be glad to answer your questions for free because that's what we do here. People have asked me, uh, I'm on TikTok and people ask me, who's paying you? And I laugh and I say, no one's paying me. I just do this to give people free legal advice. And people say there must be a gimmick. And I say, I know how that is the perception of lawyers in general. Not only does no one pay us, we pay, we pay the station to have this radio program and TV program because we want to give legal advice to people so they don't screw up their life and make stupid mistakes. If I had $100 for every time someone calls us after they made a bonehead mistake in a criminal case, in a traffic case, in a family law case, in a landlord-tenant case, I would be rich because then it's too late in most cases to help them. So that's why I'm telling you, ask the questions for free before you screw up your legal case. And that's why I tell people on TikTok, just follow me. And then you get free legal advice by clicking one button. Boop. And call our law firm, 877-466-5245. Very, it's a toll-free number, and we'll answer your questions. And if you're calling from TikTok or on TikTok, just DM me after the show's after after the show's over, and I'll try to answer your question. It can't be any more confusing, any any different than that. Of course, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I just want to tell you with this Delta variant and the law, there's certain things that really, really are important. One is the Department of Defense is going to order as of September 15th, or when the FDA approves the vaccine, whichever, whichever is earliest, that every single member in the U.S. Defense Department, over 1.4 million members, must be vaccinated. And what if you don't want to be vaccinated? You're out. Who in their right mind wants to give up their military career and refuse to take a vaccine that will protect them and protect other people from being infected by them. And imagine the law. The law is saying, we can't force you to do anything, but we can take away your job, we can take away your ability to go places, and they're gonna to continue to do that until people understand the importance of this health emergency. Everyone wants it to go away, and it will go away if we just get together and take the damn shot. Anyway, after the break, Neelam Fister, Family Law. I can't wait to ask her the questions and get the answers. Go to the break. You've been charged with a crime, and now you're facing the loss of your freedom. Where do you turn to get out of jail or stay out of jail? The law offices of Wallen and Claridge. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With over 20 years experience and attorneys who work in your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. When you need help, make one call. Make it to Wallen and Claridge. 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? Hey, are you okay to drive? Yeah, I'm fine. If you've been arrested for DUI and are facing DMV and court hearings, it could mean losing your license, your job, and even your freedom. But Wallen and Claridge can help. Just call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With attorneys who know your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. 
Will you be? When your children are taken by social workers, it may be the worst day of your life. When will I see my children again? Where are they going? How can I get them back? Who can I turn to for help to end this nightmare? The answers to all these questions are a phone call or email away. Wallen and Clarish have been helping defend parents who are battling the system to regain custody of their children for 40 years. Many of their clients have done nothing wrong to warrant their children being taken from them. Other clients may regret some action that they've taken with their children. However, in every case, the clients desperately need their children back. That's where Wallen and Clarich comes in. They know the dependency system. They will do all they can to work to try to get your children back with you. Take the first step and call Wallen and Clarish now for a free phone consultation at 877-466-5245. That's 877-466-5245. Or visit WKLaw.com to chat with us. They'll be there when you call. If you are facing criminal charges, your entire future is at stake. You need to act now to protect your job, your family, and your freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. Wallen and Claridge has over 30 years of experience in fighting for our clients' rights. With local offices in Riverside and San Bernardino, we are here to help you now. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL or go to WKLaw.com. How much is your freedom worth? Call 877-466-5245. The call is free. Will you be? When you have a warrant for your arrest, it's a very scary time in your life. When you drive a car, you have to be extra careful that you do not commit any sort of moving violation. You have to be looking over your shoulder checking for police officers. Will you be stopped and thrown in jail? What a horrible feeling. For over 40 years, we have helped thousands of persons resolve their problem with having a warrant. In some cases, we can actually appear in court for you without you being present to recall the warrant. Depending on the facts of your case, you may never have to do one minute in jail. Stop living in fear. Call us now for a free phone consultation at 877-4-NO-JAIL. That is 877-4-NO-JAIL. Or go to WKLaw.com. Isn't it time to get your life back? We will be there when you call. Hi, everybody. This, we're back the WK Law Power Hour, and Neelam Kalon Fister will be our guest, but I think we have a caller calling in with a question. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. I really appreciate it. Um, I actually have a really good question. So about a couple months ago, I had a failure to control my vehicle, and the brake line busted. So I couldn't push the brakes. I was freaking out, and I hit the guardrail. In result of that, I owe ten grand for the guardrail and have two points on my license. So then my premium on my insurance went up from 105 to 265. Mm. Is there anything I can do to get those points off my license and maybe uh, have the guardrail paid for somehow? Okay, that's a good question. It starts with why did you have this happen. Are you saying that it happened because you lost control of the car? Correct. Because my brakes okay. went out. So I, I couldn't stop. I was on the highway going about, you know, 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And all that was there was this guardrail. And I had nothing but cars on my right and nothing on my left but a guardrail. So I figured if I get over, my car will eventually slow down if I cut the guardrail a little bit. And as okay. a result, a lady pulled over, called the police. The police cited me for this failure to control my car, but really it was a brake line. And I have okay, proof what, of that from the car dealership also. What state are you in? I'm in Ohio. Okay. Well, since I work, I'm a California law firm, I would only be able to talk to you for California law. I'm not sure how it crosses over, but I will tell you that in California, to be guilty of a traffic infraction, there has to be an intentional act on your part. So in mm -hmm. California, if your car malfunctions and that yeah. leads to the uh, reason for the accident or the injury, um, you shouldn't be found guilty of anything in California. You wouldn't yeah. have any points on your record. You wouldn't no, have any haven't. fine. If the problem is you understand these traffic judges sit and hear every guy that uh, every kind of story every day yeah. right 
And right, yeah. they have to decide who's telling the truth. So did you have a traffic trial? Um, I just paid the ticket. I didn't know what, I mean, I knew, well, I didn't get the, here's what happened. So the car was towed and it took two tow trucks to get it off. And they had to call um, another company to cut the wires. So there were three tow trucks involved. So I got charged for three tow trucks on top of the other truck that had to cart the gut rail. So that was six thousand dollars just for them to do that then i had to go get my car towed to a um from there was a five hundred dollar bill from there and then i had to get it towed to uh my dealer and the dealer showed me that the the brake line busted that's why my brakes would not work okay first of all the first mistake is i don't know why you paid the ticket why didn't you you should have pled not guilty and set up for a trial and told the judge that you did not that it was not an intentional act. Also, you could have taken your car to a mechanic and the mechanic could hopefully have verified that in fact yeah. the reason that this happened not because you were negligent operator, but that right. it was because of what you just said. Why didn't you yeah. do that? Because by then the trial the whole court was over. It no, no, but it was only over the- because you pled guilty. You you admitted by you pleading guilty is what caused the, how long ago was this? Um, it was a month ago. Okay. So it may be, I'm worried that I don't know what the law is in Ohio, but it may be too late for you oh, now to no. come back and okay. say, I want to withdraw my plea because in, unless mm-hmm. you can withdraw your plea, I hate to say it. You're probably SOL. SOL. I figured. Okay. I'm sorry. I wish it was different, you know, because yeah. you, well, you know, lesson learned. I don't know these things. Now I do. <laughs> so. But when, you know, what, what can you do? It's over now. But shouldn't my insurance pay for the guardrail? Hello? Oops. Okay, we're back. Neela. Yes. Okay. So, um, welcome to the show. Neela is a brilliant lawyer with Wallen and Claridge. Anytime anyone has a family law matter, we call on Neelam to help us out and to answer the questions because she knows the answers. Neelam, can you just, I'd like to ask you some questions because people, when they call, they want to know, well, who's the lawyer in the firm that would be handling the family law cases? They like to know more about the person, right? So why don't you tell us how long you've been a lawyer, first of all, Okay, I have been a lawyer for over 11 years. Okay. Half years. And why did you decide to become a lawyer? Um, I initially, when I was an undergraduate uh, or undergrad I, at UC Santa Cruz, I um, you know, majored in biology, but I, I came to realize that, um, you know, I think my strengths were in um, English, you know, in the um, liberal arts. So I uh, changed my major to political science. Okay. And from there, uh, you know, I, I like to argue. My dad says I'm quite a combative person at times. So I decided, hey, maybe I'll give law school a try. So after undergrad, what law school did you go to? I went to uh, Thomas M. Cooley Law School. It's in Lansing, Michigan. I believe now they've changed their name. So they're Western, Univers- Western Michigan University School of Law. And then you, when did you come to California? I came, moved back to California in December of 2007. Okay, so you've been here and practicing in California for about 11 years. Yes, that is correct. And the primary area that you practice more than any other area would be what? Family law. Okay, and what made you interested in that area of law as opposed to any other area of law? Um, I kind of stumbled into family law. Um, my mom's a physician in the um, Inland Empire, and she had a patient, um, and, you know, they would get to talking, and she asked, oh, what is your daughter up to? And my mom had mentioned that I passed the bar, and I was looking to, you know, work with an attorney, and she said that she knew a family law attorney in Laverne, and, um, you know, providing my mom her information, and I gave um, that attorney a call. And, you know, she called me on Wednesday and then on Friday she said, hey, would you like to make your first uh, appearance in court? And I said, sure. So I made a, an appearance um, in a criminal case. It was a, a misdemeanor case in San Bernardino um, at the historic courthouse. And then I 
came back to her office and we talked a little bit more about how you know, I could get into family law and she said, yeah, I'm, this is what I, she primarily does family law. So it kind of stumbled into it and have been in it ever since. What gives you the, be- the greatest satisfaction in handling a family law case? When, when what happens, do you feel the most gratified that you were able to do something to help a person? I wouldn't say it's all about winning all the time. I mean, a lot of people go into these situations and um, sometimes they're, you know, they really, they're just interested in just making the other person pay for some, you know, uh, perceived wrong. Um, For me, it's just, you know, minimizing, I guess, um, the risks to them. If there's children involved, I like to think that whatever arrangement we're able to work out or whatever the judge orders is in the best interest of the children, you know, and I, you know, kind of, um, reiterate that and can, you know, to my clients so that they can kind of see that, you know, it's, it's better to be more amicable with a person and, you know, try to get through the stressful situation as best as you can. Um, then, you know, you know, I guess go out for blood, so to speak. So probably one of the most important goals when you take on a case is to do everything you can to see that the children of the marriage are not harmed, right? That, yes, that is correct. And in many of the family law situations that we get, they often come into the office and they say something like, I just found out that my spouse is cheating on me. I want to take him to the cleaners. What is your answer to that in terms of the connection between one spouse cheating on the other and them somehow getting the benefit, the person that was cheated on getting some financial reward from that? Um, I you know, tell them kindly that the policy in California is California is a no-fault state. So no matter what transpired in the marriage, uh, California, the judge will just, it's a community property state, so it's an equitable, equitable distribution of the assets and debts. So the answer is, no matter what the spouse did, no matter who they cheated with, man, woman, or anything else, that is not going to give the other spouse a benefit when it comes to child support or spousal support, correct? Correct. Right. Now, does it ever play a part in the overall case if one spouse has cheated on the other spouse in any way? It may come into play with custody and visitation, you know, depending on if this person, the person that they have the affair with is is still in the picture, if there was you know, residing with that individual, if there's some sort of custody visitation arrangement worked out, if that individual is a, you know, I would say more or less a role model, if it's someone that um, the children have bonded with, um, with that, you know, wh- who lives with the other parent, um, you know, and it's, so again, it's, it's, you know, it's just kind of looking at that person and they're, you know, whether it's a good fit and overall, you know, thinking about how this person is going to affect this, the, these children's lives. Okay. When people come in to your office and they say they want a divorce and they have two young children and they ask, how is the court going to decide what child custody I will have? What, how does that work? What do you tell them and what will the court use as a guide to decide how child custody would be divided? Well, and um, most case, I mean, the the starting point is, you know, the de facto is joint legal custody. Uh, all parties have joint legal co- custody absent some sort of like um, underlying issues with one parent over the other. You know, were they incarcerated? Do they have substance abuse issues? Um, have they been, um, I guess, CPS has been involved in their case. So the, the parties will, you know, automatically be awarded joint legal custody. Now, in terms of physical custody, it's on a, a, you know, it's it's a timeshare. So if, if one person, one parent works more than the other parent, if one person was, let's say, a doctor and the other person, parent, you know, for all intents and purposes in this situation was a wife and she's the homemaker and the primary caretaker, these are young children, they may be very bonded with their mother and not used to residing with father, you know, half the time. So I think the court would say it's more appropriate for children to remain with mother and then work out some sort of, you know, reasonable visitation with father. Oftentimes in situations, parties will end up going to mediation to work out something if they can't, if we can't, you know, hammer out an agreement. 
Let's talk about the difference because many people do not understand the difference between legal custody and physical custody. So why don't you first explain what is legal custody and what how does that play out? What does it mean to have legal custody? Legal custody is, um, I guess, a, a, um, a doctrine regarding like uh, making major decisions regarding the children, like reg regarding their um, their schooling, their um, extracurricular activities or religious affiliation, things of that. And, you know, it's mostly, you know, regard um, geared towards, you know, who may who can make decisions regarding like, health, you know, their health, safety, well-being. That's what legal custody is. So let's custody, let's stop for a second. So legal custody, when you're going to divorce your spouse and you have two children, say eight and ten, if the court awards legal custody to you equally, does that mean that you guys have to agree on what doctor they go to, what school they go to, um, what sports they participate in after school? Is that what legal custody means? Yes. And also, in addition, I, I want to add that's also child care providers who will be watching the children when they're not in your um, in your custody. You mean, OK, who is the be the babysitter? They have to agree on who the babysitter will be or what preschool they go to in addition, right? Yes. OK, but what happens if uh, let's say it's a 16 year old kid and he's he's doing great and the mom wants him to go to this private school because it's going to be a, a prerequisite to get into a great college. And the father says, no, I don't want him to go to that college or that school. He's been in the same high school, the public high school. He has great friends. What, how do they work it out if they have joint legal custody? The mother will have to petition the court for that request as, you know, it maybe is, as, um, I guess as trivial or, you know, as easy as it sounds, she's going to have to petition the court. The father will argue his case. Maybe she, mother's asking father to pay half of this private school tuition. The father does not have the funds because he's, you know, paying mother X amount of money for child support. Um, what does the child want? He's 16 years old, so he's going to be interviewed the, by the media, and maybe the judge will inquire of him and you know require him to come to court. So that's a very good point. What Neelam said, for those that weren't listening, couldn't hear, is that first of all, the, at 16 years old, the court's going to ask the child or the mediator is going to ask the child what they want, and they can take that into consideration. And if the parents can't agree, then they have to go to court, and then the court will first send the case to a mediator to try to work it out. And if it can't be worked out, then it has to be a full bone battle in court. And as Neelan will tell you, that's expensive because in family law, you're paying a lawyer by the hour for their time to try to, to convince the court that your position is correct. And that can be a lot of money, right? In a um, case like that? It could be very drawn out and it could be very expensive. Right. So it's very, very advisable to try to work it out. And I know in a situation that I painted, maybe it can't be worked out. Maybe the mother is just positive that the child needs to go to the school and the father is just as positive that it would be detrimental to the child and it might end up in court. And these kind of things are why family law courts are very crowded. And sometimes when the fam our clients want to get into court real quick, we say, well, there's tons of things going on like this in court when parents just can't agree. And sometimes I'll say, sometimes parents lose sight of really what's in the best interest of the what's in the best interest of the child, and often their own baggage gets in the way of them making rational decisions. You'd agree with that too, right? Yes. Yeah. So what other, what other conditions um, play out in this whole thing about child custody. That means, is it only just which parent works more? Or what else does the court look at in deciding who is the better provider for the child? I'm now talking about physical custody. In fact, let's start there. In fact, you know what we're gonna do? Let's take a break. And after the break, we're gonna start with talking about what physical custody is, now that we've talked about um, legal custody. So let's go to a break and we we'll back with Neelam after the break.
You've been charged with a crime, and now you're facing the loss of your freedom. Where do you turn to get out of jail or stay out of jail? The law offices of Wallen and Claridge. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With over 20 years' experience and attorneys who work in your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. When you need help, make one call. Make it to Wallen and Claridge. 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? When your children are taken by social workers, it may be the worst day of your life. When will I see my children again? Where are they going? How can I get them back? Who can I turn to for help to end this nightmare? The answers to all these questions are a phone call or email away. Wallen and Clarish have been helping defend parents who are battling the system to regain custody of their children for 40 years. Many of their clients have done nothing wrong to warrant their children being taken from them. Other clients may regret some action that they've taken with their children. However, in every case, the clients desperately need their children back. That's where Wallen and Clarich comes in. They know the dependency system. They will do all they can to work to try to get your children back with you. Take the first step and call Wallen and Clarish now for a free phone consultation at 877-466-5245. That's 877-466-5245. Or visit WKLaw.com to chat with us. They'll be there when you call. Hey, are you okay to drive? Yeah, I'm fine. If you've been arrested for DUI and are facing DMV in court hearings, it could mean losing your license, your job, and even your freedom. But Wallen and Claridge can help. Just call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With attorneys who know your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? When you are facing a serious criminal charge, it means you may be looking at many years in prison or doing up to one year in county jail. Most people do not know who to turn to in their time of need for expert legal guidance. What you do next can make the difference between ending up in prison for many years or having your charges dismissed and you going free. At this very critical time in your life, you need Wallen and Clarish fighting for you. Wallen and Clarish has 40 years of criminal defense experience and they work very hard to do all they can to win their clients' cases. Wallen and Clarish has a team of 10 criminal defense lawyers fighting for their clients every day. They help people with cases pending throughout California. They successfully defend cases dealing with murder, sex crimes, all felonies, as well as misdemeanors. Check out WKLaw.com for some real client success stories. They offer a free phone consultation to answer your questions. Call them toll-free at 877-4-NO-JAIL. That's 877-4-NO-JAIL. They will be there when you call. If you are facing criminal charges, your entire future is at stake. You need to act now to protect your job, your family, and your freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. Wallen and Claridge has over 30 years of experience in fighting for our clients' rights. With local offices in Riverside and San Bernardino, we are here to help you now. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL or go to WKLaw.com. How much is your freedom worth? Call 877-466-5245. The call is free. Will you be? Okay, we're back at the WK Law Power Hour with Neelam Fister, and we're, as, we're asking questions and getting really good answers about family law matters. And right now we're talking about child custody, and we've just finished talking about the definition of legal custody, and now we're going to talk about physical custody, because in family law cases, the judge has to decide two different things. How are they going to split up legal custody and how are they going to split up physical custody? So why don't you talk to us, Neelam, about what physical custody is? Physical custody is um, where the child will be residing the majority of their time, like where they'll be sleeping, eating their meals, etc. Okay. Now there's many criteria that the court considers. Can you go over some of the criteria that the court considers in deciding how to divide physical custody. The court will consider the history of the marriage, who has been the primary caretaker, uh, caregiver of the children uh, uh, throughout the marriage, um, who has more time, you know, based on their, you know, uh, work obligations to care for the children. Um, is there a history of domestic violence 
you know, is what one parent the perpetrator of domestic violence? Um, you know, there's a family code section 3044 that states if you're the perpetrator of domestic violence, that you um, sole legal, sole physical custody is granted to the victim. Let me interrupt you for a second. So that's extremely important. You just said if someone uh, is involved in domestic violence, they can't have primary physical custody or legal custody. However, don't they have to be convicted of domestic violence as opposed to just being charged? Or is it enough that the police arrest them for domestic violence? Um, it's enough for the police to arrest them if one party, especially in family law, if one party um, files for a temporary restraining order, it's automatically granted. And then it's, you know, a bit of an uphill battle for the uh, alleged, you know, perpetrator, abuser. They have to petition the court and, you know, argue their case as to why they should be given any sort of visitation with the children. So it would seem to me that either parent, if they know this law, can really do a horrible thing by falsely accusing someone of domestic violence and getting a judge to grant a temporary restraining order. And that would mean that that parent would be denied access to his children for a substantial period of time while that thing gets litigated at least, right? Yes. And, and, and you know, I, this is, you know, a very all too common uh, practice. So one party gains, I guess, so to speak, a leverage and, and, you know, any potential you know, divorce proceedings if they haven't already done so, filed for divorce. So in that kind of situation, what is the burden of proof required for the judge to, to, to decide that whether or not the domestic violence actually happened or not? Um, it is based on a preponderance of evidence. So it's a very low burden of proof. There's the, um, you know, you know, crim in criminal law, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. But in family law for restraining order, it's, it's um, based on the preponderance of evidence. So the judge could just look at the pleadings, you know, take some testimony and then make their decision. So uh, preponderance of the evidence standard is 51% of the evidence. That means the judge has to believe by slightly more than half of the evidence that what the spouse is saying that the person was struck by the other parent is true to grant the temporary restraining order, right? Yes. And what if they grant the temporary restraining order, that means they're going to not be able to see the kids for between the time of the temporary restraining order, at least until the time of the permanent restraining order hearing? That is correct. Unless they can make a, an argument that there's a need for them to see the children. Otherwise, it's it's automatically, you know, the other party is, is granted so legal, so physical custody until the At, trial. How long is it normally between the temporary restraining order being granted and the hearing for the permanent restraining order? It's usually 21 days. 21 days. Okay. So extend out if the other party wants to obtain an attorney, they can request the um, accused can request a, a, a continuance to okay. either count prepare. At the temporary restraining order hearing, is there is it a full blown hearing? Do you have the right to call witnesses, or is it just very short? No, you have you have the right to to call witnesses, but. The court is interested in people that are percipient witnesses, people that have been, have seen the parties interact and have witnessed, you know, the alleged abuse. If you're not a percipient witness and you're repeating what another person, what the victim told you, then that is, you know, hearsay more or less. Okay. Okay. So now you get to the permanent restraining order hearing. That, that's, is that like a full blown trial? It, it can, it can be, it can be a, you know, a, Quite a trial. It could be you know, a couple hours or it could be something where the two parties just testify and the judge makes their ruling. And is it the same burden of proof or is it a higher burden of proof for a permanent restraining order? No, it is It is the same burden of proof. Just 51% of the evidence? Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. If the court listens to the evidence and grants the permanent restraining order, how long can that be for? It could be anywhere from three to five years. Three and to then, five years? Yes. So, and, and then it, go ahead. Oh, and then with respect to um, how that affects the accused, I mean, at the initial, uh, when the te initial temporary restraining order is granted, 
if they are gun owners, they have they have to file the DV 800, which means they have to file proof that they own firearms and that they've turned it into law enforcement. So if the temporary and, restraining order is granted, they have to give up their guns to law enforcement, first of all. They, they're yeah. gone. Yes. At that time. Yes. But if the court grants the permanent restraining order for three to five years, that means that the parent cannot see his children for three to five years? No, I mean, there there are certain things under 3044 that, that the accused can overcome. That have they participated in a 52-week batterer's intervention class? You know, other um, additional counseling, if there are substance abuse issues involved, have they um, engaged in, you know, some sort of counseling for that or sought help through, like, you know, AA you know, to, get, to get those things under control? When you've completed, you made some progress, with respect to those things, you can petition the court again, you know, the family law court, to um, have some sort of visitation rights. But that means that the parent that the judge found had struck the other parent, they have to come back to court after they've finished a 52-week batters program and say, look, I'm better, please give me visits with my kid, right? Yes, that is correct. But in that case, that meant the parent will not have seen his kid for one year, right? No, that that is true. Unless the other party is is willing to say, "Hey, I, you know, I got this restraining order, but I think enough time has passed that we've cooled off, things have settled a bit. Let's see if we can work something out." And that's where it helps to have an attorney, uh, you know, on either side to do that. But what about what about monitored visits? What about that parent? Can the parent? Ask the court that if they get an approved monitor, then he they can have visitation. Um, that that is an, an an alternate arrangement as well. But again, the the court would like the accused to part to make sub substantial progress in a batterer's intervention class if they've been convicted of domestic violence or they have a permanent restraining order. Again, do you mean do you mean the court won't let them even see the kids with a monitor until they finish the uh, batterer's program, or do you mean? They can still see the kid, but only with a monitor until they finish the program. Well, I mean, it's on a case by case basis. It's also what the other the the you know the victim wants as well. What do they feel comfortable with? Because, I mean, you can kind of think of it as in they hold the cards. They have the advantage when a permanent restraining order is granted. And obviously, they hate the other parent. Period. So they're not going to want to normally give up anything right if they've gone to the court to get to not let the father normally it's the father see the kid it's unlikely that the other parent is just going to say sure you can see the kid right and if the the conduct that led to the uh filing of the temporary restraining order and the issuance of the permanent restraining order is so egregious so heinous the judge on their own will say no i do not think it's appropriate at this time for this individual to see their children regardless Okay. Because 344, you know, presides. Sure. Okay, I want to go to another topic that comes up always in these cases, especially when there's marriages over a short period of time, and that is spousal support. So could you explain basically, first of all, what is spousal support? Spousal support, or what people call it, is alimony. It's, it's providing the other party with support. You know, they were used to a certain lifestyle during the marriage. And when parties separate, you know, one person, uh, one party could have been the high, higher wage earner and their lower in a uh, lower wage earner spouse needs some monetary support in order to um, sustain themselves, sustain a, a lifestyle, a reasonable lifestyle. What is the criteria that the law in California provides for a court to determine whether spousal support should be granted, and if so, in what amount it should be granted? Well, it's um, uh, for temporary support, it's just based on what what's called ex-spouse. It's a computer program or DISO master. The court takes into consideration, you know, one party's income versus the other party's income for spousal support, and then makes a temporary order. What about beyond, and what? how long is temporary order? Well, a temporary order is until you, you know, have a, you know, a hearing or you come to an, a, a judgment that, you know, outlines what a final order is. The court takes into consideration for, you know, um, any final orders regarding spousal support, the length of the marriage. 
that's you okay. know a huge consideration. Okay, and what is how does that work? Let's say you are married to someone, and you're married to someone for a year, and you have no kids, and you're married for a year, and you say, "I want out of the marriage," and but I want spouse support. What is the likelihood someone's going to get spouse support after a one-year marriage, and what will the court consider in that kind of situation? Again, your um, the party's respective income, but if it's a marriage under under ten years, which is the the magic, I guess, uh, time frame time period that the court looks at, it's half the length of the marriage. So in this instance, it would be six months. So if you've been married less than ten years, the general rule is that the max on spouse support is one half of the marriage. So in that situation, the maximum amount of time that person would get support is six months, right? Yes, and then the court would also issue what's called a Gavron order, which is an order stating that the other party, the party receiving support, needs to uh, make reasonable efforts to become self-sufficient. Are there right. cases, I understand, are there cases when uh, the court might not award any support on such a short marriage. Um, well, I guess if so, if someone is seeking an annulment on the basis of annulment, on the basis of fraud, then the court will take that into consideration. Okay. Now, a longer marriage of, say, 10 years, um, it's common for that per the person that makes the less amount of money to get some amount of spouse support for five years. That would be the common result, but it doesn't have to be five years, but is that the most common result? Yes, that is the most common. And how does the court figure out how much? What guess, do they base that on? Um, uh, for like, a, I guess a permanent support order, it's, get, it's, it's more, it's straying away from the DISO master. They do take that calculation into consideration, but again, it's you know the um, the market of you know the um, the the lower wage earners' age, their health, their education. Are they able to find employment? You know, are they you know what skills they have? Are they going back to school? So all those things the court factors in in deciding an amount, right? Yes. Now, what happens if the marriage is more than, say, 20 years? Is there a different, I guess, rule, if there's such a rule, that if you have a lengthy marriage, and is that considered a lengthy marriage? Yes, 20 years, it's, again, anything over 10 years is, is what the court considers a lengthy marriage for spousal support purposes. And 40, Family Code Section 4320 is what governs that. So, again, that takes into, that, you know, outlines the age of the parties, the health of the parties, um, any history of domestic violence, the marketability, the the um, lifestyle. You know, are you, you used to a certain standard of living? That's a, that's the magic phrase, standard of living, during the marriage, and how are you able to maintain that post separation? So, is there a rule that the court can award spouse support for life? if you've been married a certain number of years? It's kind of like an unspoken rule, I guess. You, If you wanted to stop spousal support, you were the person paying spousal support in a long-term marriage, um, you really need to get your ducks in a row and make that argument that the um, party receiving support, you know, significant time has passed since post-separation. Say you were married for 20 years, but you've been separated for 10, and a divorce decree was entered, and that party can still, you know, go out and get a job. You know, you know, the, our, your your standard of living, your your um, financial picture has changed. Also, you can make that argument. I understand, but what what people have asked me, but and, and many different times, and I want to clarify it. Let's say you get married when you're 20, and you live, you're married for 20 years. So at 40, you divorce, and let's say the the wife is a high, high income earner and the husband has been staying home with the kids. Now the kids are grown and now they're divorcing. Is it, does that mean that a 20 year marriage that the husband can s get spousal support from the wife for the rest of his life? Because it's a 20 year marriage and he, you know, he stayed home with the kids 
and the and the wife works, you know, and makes good money. Can the husband then literally get spouse support for the rest of his life? Yes. Wow. The court, the court will take into yes, consideration. Yes, said yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Sacrifices that he made throughout the marriage and not obtaining employment, and you know, in lieu of daycare, them provi- paying for a daycare provider. He was the, um, you know, parent who stayed home with the kids, maybe took them to school, you know, was, you know, participated in other extracurricular activities while the wife in this instance was able to go out and make money. And maybe she got promotions because of his, the sacrifices and obligations he paid to, you know, made to the household. Okay. But does that mean that the husband can just stay home now and watch TV and, you know, and not have to go to work? because now he's getting a chunk, a good chunk of money every month or doesn't he have to make efforts to go to work? If there, if there's a Gavron order in place, then he'll have to make reasonable efforts to become self self supporting. But if there isn't, then yes, the, the, you know, the court will say, well, you know, this is the bargain for exchange you made during your marriage. Okay. Now, what if that person comes in and wants to hire us, you, and says, this is ridiculous. Um, I'm now the wife, I'm sorry, wants to come in and hire you. She says, I'm now 50 and my husband is 50 and I've been paying him spouse support for 10 years and he's not getting off his blank to get a job. What can you do? What steps would you take to go to court and try to terminate or lower the spouse support? We would look at the judgment. The judgment is a controlling document. Did they have some sort of agreement that strays from the common practice that spousal support does not, you know, does not have a term, an end date for a long-term marriage. Was there a Gavron order issued, um, or a Gavron order issued? Um, are the, the wife, in this case, a higher wage earner, does she have health problems that have prevented, are, are going to prevent her from working, continuing to work? Does she want to retire? You know, you know, think, you know, has her financial picture changed? You know, maybe, you know, she lost a lot of money in the stock market, whatever have you. So you would bring all those kind of things up and to try to convince the judge that it's unfair for the wife to continue to have to pay him that sum of money indefinitely, right? Yes. And, it, you know, let's say there are children involved. Maybe the wife was the one providing support for the adult children. He's okay. Green, providing support for everyone. Okay. One more example real fast. So what happens if same situation, except they divorce when they're 65, 65, and the wife wasn't working, and now it's 10 years later, and the the husband's 75. At some point, can't the husband hire you to go back to court and say, I want to retire? I I can't, do I have to work for the rest of my life to pay her? Um, yeah, he can. Again, again, the court will look at, you know, the the financial um, picture of both parties involved, their health, their age in this case. Um, you know, does he have a, a nice retirement plan in place? Did wife, did they, did, during, did, in their judgment, did they have a quadro? So wife received part of husband's retirement or will, will receive sure. part of husband's retirement? So, you know, are they eligible for Social Security? Is she collecting it now? Sure. Is he collecting it now? So there's, a, so there's a lot of issues that go on. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to thank you very much, Neelam, for coming on the show. There are so many other family law issues that we have that I'd love to have you come back on the show again because we're going to talk about grandparents' rights. We have so many questions about grandparents' rights. They call our office, and we have a lot of experience in that, and I'd like Neelam to come back and talk about that as well as guardianship, which is another interesting area. So, Neelam, will you come back again in another show? Oh, absolutely. Thank Great. you for having me. No problem. I, thank you guys for watching the show. Legal power, legal power, knowledge is legal power. I want you guys to never forget that because the more legal knowledge you have, the smarter you'll be, the better you'll be when a legal question comes up. I want you guys to have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next Tuesday, 3 p.m. Pacific Coast time. Have a great week. Thank you.